Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on unlocking green finance and carbon markets in India. I'm very happy to have this illustrious panel with us today, starting from my left, Mr. Amit Sinha, General Manager at RBI. Uh, we have Mr. B.S. Venkatesh, Deputy Management Director at NAPFID. Uh, we have Ms. Rupa Satish, Country Head of Sustainable Banking at Indusind Bank. Uh, Mr. Sanjeev Saraf, Joint Managing Director at Bob Capital Markets. Uh, and finally, Ms. Anjali Bansal, Founding Partner at Avana Capital. I think it's a very interesting topic as, as we look at green finance, but perhaps I want to step back and start with a slightly interesting take on it. Um, I don't know if anyone has actually watched this series called Extrapolation. It's actually about climate change. And what it talks about is how different cities would look like in 2030, 40, 50, and, and, and so on. Um, and few of the things that struck out as I watched some of it was, you know, kids are going to school in a mask. Now, some of us might say we've already seen that in COVID. But, you know, even to go out to say today is a really, you know, the temperatures are so hot that we can't even go out to play. Um, people having diseases where they cannot actually go out, they have breathing difficulties because of, you know, the change that has happened. Um, it talks about different cities like Miami, Tel Aviv, and then it comes to Bombay. And it talks about how there's actually a daytime curfew because it's too hot. Um, it talks about many species which have actually got extinct. Um, and then also about how many varieties of, you know, food are actually pretty much extinct. So there is a last grain of rice which is stolen from a seed bank in, in Sweden and then brought back all the way to India. So these are, you know, again, someone might say it's extrapolation. So, you know, what of that will happen versus not? It's, it's obvious in the name. But when, even when you look at some of the numbers, right, it do, they do beg us to think about some of these possibilities because if I, if I look at the estimates, 2.5 trillion required by 2030, uh, you know, in, in terms of our needs. Uh, and if I really look at shortfall, we have about 100 to $150 billion of shortfall in funding every year. And obviously, this gets difficult more and more as time progresses. So clearly, uh, you know, this is a pretty important discussion uh, for many of us to have today. And in that context, let me maybe start with the first, uh, you know, question itself, which is more looking at the ecosystem. Uh, and, and perhaps, you know, starting with you, uh, Mr. Amit, in terms of as a regulator, what do you think, uh, you know, what the regulator can do, is looking to do, RBI has obviously been very progressive in coming up with many guidelines with respect to green finance. What is your perspective on, you know, how India can look at, uh, you know, addressing some of the challenges with respect to climate? Thank you, and uh, thank you for... Uh giving the opportunity to speak. Uh, you know, in the previous uh, panel, I heard one very famous scientist name, that's Newton's law. And uh, I am really reminded, of course, I would dread my school days. I mean, remembering about the Newton's laws of motion, but today I think I should say on that. So Newton's, Newton law of motion, the three laws, that's what the regulators, let me just say like that. The first law about the force, that's what Mr. Prabodh was mentioning. So regulator can basically identify when to give the push, pull, the change of direction. That's the first law. The second law is also equally important. Of course, stuff, if you see from the climate risk or climate change aspect is basically the second law talks about the acceleration, the measurement, the assessment. But that is what the financial system needs to do and the regulator and along with the financial system has to assess, of course that's going forward but that's the second thing which the regulator can do. And third, after doing the first two, it has to expect the reaction matches the action and the expectations. So these are the th three things, of course, from the Newton's law, I can say. But going like you said about the India, 
the regulators can really work with the five C's. What is it? Which are the five C's? That is, you know, climate change cannot be tackled by one institution, one NGO, one research institution, one company. It is not, simply not, not or even, even one, one jurisdiction. Yeah, exactly. It is simply not possible. So, what can we all, sitting here or sitting outside or whatever, what we can do is basically 5C. Contributing to the coordination efforts to combat climate change. And that is what, with these two things, any regulator, why only RBI, would be looking at. I hope no, I think, clear. I, I think that makes perfect sense. We'll probably, you know, elaborate on that a bit more as, as we come to, you know, the next, uh, you know, questions. Um, uh, Mr. Venkatesh, you know, as, uh, you know, as a new institution on the block, uh, NAPFID, what are your perspectives? Obviously, infrastructure itself is a pretty large agenda, but then adding climate change to it, how, how do you perceive these two together? Uh, it is, uh, if you look at the environment, the numbers when we look at this decarbonization, I don't know how many zeros we have to add. That is the <laughs> numbers which we are looking at. Very difficult to even memorize and keep it and understand because it goes beyond the imagination. That is the lineup. So when all the resources are becoming so important and uh, it is uh, so much in deficit, so also the finance. So where exactly we bring this kind of amount which is required for a simple uh, country like India, it requires that much of amount and the global level we need to see that. So are we really an early movers to get this kind of resources which is currently available because investors are looking at it and they would like to participate as a thematic uh, funds and everybody would like to do that. So how much we are able to do it and how quickly we are able to make this uh, doable so that we can bring actually the right capital which is required. So in terms of debt, the institutions are well equipped. We don't find, if you see any project which is viable, today it is over subscription. Banks are all getting uh, a smaller portion of their sanctions. That is the level of uh, uh, the competition which is there in the market. So as you rightly said, the amount of requirement of 120 to 150 billion dollars per annum, which is almost three to four times of the current level which is required. So which is very difficult to mobilize that kind of resources. So we need a collaborative effort on the institutional level we need to look at. And are we really have a, a sufficient pipeline? That again a question mark. There are funds who are willing, because now after the NAFID has started operationalization, we are meeting most of the multilateral banks, some of the funds, investors. So everybody is looking only green uh, as a theme, where uh, we can uh, definitely collaborate and we can get into them. But when we look at the projects, even the latest newspaper report says the solar uh, implementation level has come down even this quarter also. See the viability of the project which is in question and the aggressive bidding which is happening is in question. And so third is the most dependent on the imports which is again a problem. So, and everything beyond that even the nature has to give that blessings of <laughs> continuous production and everything. Technology is just evolving, so huge investment has to happen on the technology. We do not know how long they will sustain and sometimes the project viability we need to question. So there comes the need of viability of funding, whether we can look at policy level. Some of the projects which are established are able to sustain, but new things which are coming up, whether it is hydrogen or CCUS technologies, those kind of things, battery, uh, those kind of technologies where at policy level what we can do and how, what kind of uh, support can be looked from the government. So these are some of the things which, uh, that is how, that is where the position we are in. So as a NAFID, as an institution, we are uh, fully open for all the uh, things which are happening in the country and uh, outside. At the same time, the mandate is very huge for us. It is, green is one among them, but we still need to look at all other aspects. So as a result, we are also trying to position ourselves as a fully green bank or a hybrid model, or it can be a separate portfolio, or it can be even looking at some floating of some subsidies only for the purpose of green financing. These are the options which we are also looking at. The things are evolving, but it takes uh, uh, longer time. Uh, we are also in the initial stage of uh, designing our own ESG policies and uh, uh, really interesting days and a lot of things to do and a lot of responsibility on, as an institution for us. Very interesting and particularly the point that, that you mentioned, I think it came up in the first panel as well that, you know, when you look at renewables, you know, some of that or there's this clustering effect that, you know, all the funding, etc., those are pretty straightforward. But when you look at new technologies, you do re need 
you know, some alternate ways to, to come in and, and we'll, you know, cover that. Uh, maybe moving to you, Rupa, and obviously, you know, Indescent has made some strides already, uh, you know, in the elements of, of green. Uh, what are your perspectives? How have you seen, you know, some of the needs, etc. Uh, increase? Yeah. Thank you. No, you spoke about the large scale investments needed for the transition that, you know, India is planning. Now here, the way I see uh, the challenge before us is A, of course, there is a gap in the overseas monies coming in. But even mobilizing of domestic capital, I think, is, is, is a challenge uh, because there are various players at different levels of awareness and understanding. Um, uh, most of the funding has been traditionally going in into green finance. Uh, but if you look at a slightly more uh, complex requirements or projects which require transition financing, um, it, it becomes then, uh, you know, slightly more uh, difficult for banks to uh, come in, understand the um, uh, what, what, what sort of projects qualify, uh, put together then a consortium of financiers who all think along similar lines on this project, qualify it as a transition financing project, and then, uh, you know, uh, provide, uh, provide the necessary funding for that. Um, I was speaking uh, to the large corporate, um, you know, discussion earlier here, and he, he was talking about uh, sustainability-linked bonds, and he was saying how uh, there are penalties if you don't achieve your targeted uh, emission reduction, uh, but uh, he has not been in a position to convince investors to give him an incentive for achieving those targets. So uh, the market, I think, is evolving, and everybody is not... Uh, at the same level, uh, so it's, it's, it's an exciting time, I think, for banks. Uh, many banks have started innovating tremendously in this space uh, because any, any uh, you know, in the beginning of any revolution, uh, you, you can, it allows you to, you know, sort of uh, put your best foot forward, understand uh, corporate requirements and provide interesting and innovative financing solutions. And that's been really the endeavor in Anderson Bank. Um, we've tried to uh, really provide solutions across the space, not only focused on large uh, mega uh, sort of uh, groups, uh, large capital requirements, but also looking at down the supply chain, uh, look at the um, uh, SMEs and the MSMEs, what kind of challenges do they face uh, when they are, uh, you know, looking at uh, industries which are uh, polluting and do they have necessary, the challenge for raising finance increases at that level even more. And we've also then taken it at the individual level. We've also put together several innovative, uh, what we call uh, green linked products or ESG linked products uh, for say rooftop solar financing for individuals, green mortgage is something that we are uh, thinking about. Uh, RBI has recently you know, come up with uh, green uh, deposits. Uh, so that, that I think is a great way when uh, at the policy level you articulate very clearly uh, what qualifies uh, for a green deposit, how should the end use uh, be put together, and that sort of unifies all the players in the systems. Then they come together and everybody has a similar approach. So I think as banks get ready uh, to uh, you know, play a dominating role in this space, um, we, need, uh, we need to work collaboratively with each other and also take guidance from RBI uh, so that um, we are at the, uh, you know, uh, we, we are not uh, challenged when there's a regulatory change and we are prepared uh, for the changes that one sees uh, coming forth. Absolutely. And I think the point that you made on SMEs is very valid because, you know, while many of the corporates are, you know, kind of starting to get familiar with the terminology, Honestly, the MSMEs do require a lot more hand-holding and, you know, there is need to be a completely different framework uh, which needs to be, you know, thought about. Uh, let me get you in, Sanjeev, at this point. I think there's been a lot of discussions about that capital is willing to come in, people want to, uh, you know, sort of uh, work on the aspects of ESG. You're obviously at the middle of it all, you know, as the investment banker. Do you find that you're able to play the right matchmaker? What are the, you know, what is your perspective sitting as 
uh, as you are in the middle of the providers and, and sort of the utilizers of capital? Yeah, thanks. I think <clears throat> I have got the views on both sides and that's the reason why <laughs> possibly uh, we have seen the evolution of new products like Invits and that's something which as an equity capital market I can understand. Mm -hmm. You saw how many years it took for an Invit or a REIT to be popular in India. Even ETFs for that matter. The way it is in market in the US, it's still not there in India. It's a matter of education. It's a matter of, I would say, commercial. I mean, I, and you rightly said, sir, RBI cannot just be one of those facilitators. It's the actual the market which has to be facilitated. In a flow of money and funds, I have firmly believe it's a commercial aspect that works and nothing else. That's the first starting point. Now, whether we call it a green bond or we call it a bond, the fact that between a bond and a green bond, the difference of coupon is just 5 bips or 10 bips doesn't differentiate. Of course, the Western economies are different and that's what I say, that whatever the Western economies have done in this aspect over the last 20 years, whatever we have done in last 6 months of having one green bond issue or the sovereign bond issue, is a long way to go. But the fact is that the Indian investors, or I would say subscribers to these bonds, are looking to a product which is simpler and maybe to that ex uh, extent I would request the regulators to little make it easier <laughs> that the clarity on expenses, clarity on things to do and of course I understand that whenever a new product comes in the market there are more questions about whether you're going to misuse it and we're already getting the name of misuse of a greenwashing coming in this. So if you have a product and you're questioning the product then the regulator is definitely going to look at it and say, okay, I'm going to stop this greenwashing and say what? And we have had instances. I'm sorry to say, any new product, even in an IPO market, look at 30, 40 years back, the regulations evolved over a period of time. I would say that I be firmly believe that the green bonds or the green financing has a huge market. And I can see that because it is a requirement on both sides, the issuers and the takers. The question is, the matchmaking, as you rightly said, happens at our end, but currently we are not seeing that happening because, two, the rate of interest is one concern. The other one is the credit rating. And as you mentioned, MSMEs, if, for example, MSMEs were allowed to do this and they have a triple B rating of a bond, tell me a single buyer on the, f on, on the road which is actually going to be keen to buy that green bond from a so-called MSME. Though the MSME of that particular company or that company would be the right MSME for the green bond because you, your money that they would be doing is a water conservation or energy conservation or something right. But that aspect alone, the commercial aspect is the most important part. And the regulations are a little hazy at the moment. It's evolving. And hence, people are a little shying away. And hence, 40-50% people are there, but at 100% market will take its own time we have seen bonds market evolve, we have seen, as I said, so they will take time for green financing or green bonds to, to be a vibrant market in India. That's my view, yeah. I understand. No, very helpful. And, you know, maybe uh, Anjali getting you, because obviously you work very deeply in the space, right? I think uh, uh, in the green space, but also, you know, this aspect which started to get touched that what doesn't, you know, work, uh, the, what happens in the West has, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, different needs and, and so on and India needs are very different. How do you see, you know, the green finance space here and your initial perspectives? So I think first of all, I look forward to the time when we don't call it green finance because all finance will be green finance. Today you don't talk it. about a business which says, oh my God, it's a technology enabled <laughs> business. You kind of wonder why is it not a technology enabled business? So sustainability today, and I say sustainability broadly as both climate action and sustainability is where digitization was 30 years ago. 30 years ago, you know, when I started in business, most companies didn't have a CTO. So other than the Valley companies, your HPs and Cisco, they were, they were IT departments. Today, digitalization is embedded across the enterprise. There is not a single business function in any large enterprise that is not digitalized. Mm. We have just started as a world the sustainableization journey. So in some ways, sustainability is the next digital. In fact, it is bigger than the next digital because it will have to happen much faster than the digital journey. It will require collaboration on a global scale. 
Climate is a global problem. It's an interconnected system. No one company, and I mean, I think you said it so well, no one company, no one country can solve it on its own. So it will require all types of collaboration, north-south, North has the capital, has been the polluter. South is the one that is going through the, the global South is going through the economic growth journey. So we will have to together find fundamentally lower carbon growth pathways for our kinds of economies. India is not going to start growing less. India continues and will want to continue growing at our 6 to 9% GDP growth over the next 25 years. We will consume more steel, more cement, more power. Our power will continue to be highly thermal, although we have the capacity. India, we actually have the capacity to meet our 2030 500 gigawatt renewable goals, but you need technology. So that brings collaboration on the other side, which is technology. A lot of these solutions don't exist today. The good news is technology cost curves are shifting fast enough. We have seen this happen in solar. We hope to see this happen in many other forms of technology on storage, on climate resilient agriculture, in we should talk about agriculture if we have time on this panel because it is important to our economy and to our both lives and livelihood. Uh, so technology and innovation, we have to have much better collaboration and much better financing for that, different kind of financing needed. And then of course large corporates where adoption takes place and then financing. Um, I think India again, just like we have been a net innovator on digitization, I think we, it's no longer world class on digital, actually it's India class on digital. The rest of the world has to catch up. We have to come up with solutions on financing that will work for us. Our journey on sustainability is not just of carbon and GHG reduction alone. It's also of adaptation and transition, as well as resilience and all of it in parallel. Products don't exist today. I think I've heard various colleagues on the panel say this. We do not have adequate lending products. for Large, large corporates don't have a problem. And particularly on the energy side, there is globally adequate capital available and frankly very attractive capital available for those large players. I heard someone say banks are not getting their allocations. That's the nature of competitive capital. But MSMEs largely very few products exist. Uh, we need to have more first loss guarantee type programs. We need to have more insurance and risk mitigation. So all those models will develop. Yeah. Uh, we are fortunate we have a very supportive government and policy regime that is forward-looking. We have the green credit program that the Honorable PM launched earlier this year. Uh, RBI as a regulator has been very supportive as well and also very forward-looking. So I think, there's, uh, I think India will create solutions like we do for not just for ourselves but for the rest of the world. Yeah, I guess the right ingredients are in place and particularly the part that you started to talk about on guarantees, insurance, etc. Right? Because those are the ones which will help get a much higher multiplier effect in terms of the capital. So I feel that can be very, very powerful. I guess, you know, then kind of getting a bit deeper into what are the type of products, what are the kind of, you know, things that the intermediaries can actually do. And maybe I'll start again with you, Amaji, and then we'll switch around the order a bit, uh, you know, just to keep it interesting. But what is your expectation as a regulator from the intermediaries? What is it that the banks or financial institutions can do, should do, uh, you know, in the space? Yeah. Very interesting questions. Uh, you know, again, Earlier, five C's hit was hitting my mind. Now, three R's are hitting my mind. So, of course, all the three R would lead to, you know, all the roads lead to Rome. That's what someone says. So, it, it's again, they have to look at their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the three R's? They have to make their balance sheet robust, resilient, and from the risk management point. So, all the three R are important. Now, let me just say what are the underlying aspects and why am I saying? There is a physical problem, physical risk, there is a physical shock, there is a transition shock. What happens? Because of this, that impacts the real economy. Fine? Now, the real economy, basically the risk gets translated to the bank's balance sheet. That's how the transmission channels happen. But the, the problem doesn't stop here. Now, banks are very important. As we have been hearing in the previous panel and the, in this panel also, the financing or the capital is very important. Now, let's say the bank's balance sheet is not robust, not resilient. What will happen? There will be a feedback loop. 
the problem in the uh, real economy will be amplified. The bank will stop lending. The insurance, there will be insurance protection gaps. Maybe the insurance premium will increase. So they will not be robust. They may not be so solvent also. The other, there can be impact on the financial stability and that's why we are worried. Or that's why the regu any regulator or any government should be worried. So these are the, you know, uh, the things that a bank should be looking at. Bank should be basically thinking on how to keep its balance sheet robust, not only today, but tomorrow as well. Because climate change, if we look at the situation, what is the physical shock today? Hardly anything. What is the transition shock today? Not much. Whatever we are talking is basically a bit moving, more forward looking. Bit more forward looking. So the bank's balance sheet has to be robust today and tomorrow. Yeah, and, and in, in some sense, they're in that unique position, right? Because you do get impacted by, you know, a lot of the disasters, etc., and they translate into your balance sheet. But by the type of lending or the type of, you know, actions that you're taking, you can, in some sense, influence, uh, you know, some of that as well. So how do you get that going in the positive loop? Uh, in some ways is, is clearly there. Uh, maybe, you know, I, and uh, Rupa, you had spoken about a number of, you know, some products that you have already launched. What are the type of initiatives or, you know, products or things that you've already done as a bank and what is it, where are the ones where you actually face challenges? Like, okay, these three things we could do, but, you know, these, if only these challenges were solved, actually we can do like 10 more. How, how do you see that? Sure, I'll try and, uh, try and articulate that. So uh, the way in which we look at it is twofold. We, we're looking at climate-related opportunities and risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, for, for uh, being well-placed to capitalize on opportunities, what we have actually started doing is working very closely with our business units and embedding uh, this thinking uh, that, you know, are we talking to our clients on uh, what kind of changes are they going through and how can we support and finance those initiatives? Uh, this is across, like I mentioned earlier, the value chain, both at the very large corporates, interest banks with, uh, you know, right from uh, the MSMEs, we have a SME unit, we have a, a large corporate unit and global corporate. So we, we are engaged across the spectrum, uh, discussing with our corporates openly what kind of, because every corporate today has some or the other capex plan, some have articulated it very clearly, their transition plan and their investments in sustainability, some are thinking about it. And some are confused about it. Uh, they, they really want to do something, but they don't know where to start and how to start. So what we have announced is a slew of products, uh, but uh, to, you know, to just uh, look at some of the more interesting ones, we've recently launched something to assist corporates in their journey. So we have at the back end tied up with a whole bunch of partners, right from people who can create the proper frameworks, uh, for raising sustainable finance, uh, which the companies can use to take it to their board and get these frameworks approved. Uh, the frameworks will articulate very clearly for them how will they raise the finance, what will be the end use, uh, what will be the governance and monitoring uh, of these end use, and the reporting of these uh, proceeds. So this is not in place in many corporates and this requires some technical handholding. So we, we are saying that if you are starting this journey, uh, do talk to us because we will then help you right from stage one, set the framework in place. Of course, we will step in and provide the finance. If, if, the, requir if the requirement for finance is large, we will rope in like-minded partners. We already are in advanced stage of discussions with various multilateral agencies who are willing to partner us here. And then uh, we, we also have a, a strong debt uh, syndication capability within the bank uh, sitting in our global markets, which will help us syndicate it uh, if we are adopting uniform framework, which is globally acceptable. 
so we can then invite global investors also into these uh, fundraise programs. So this is so here we have uh, launched four products, uh, which is uh, green loans and bonds, sustainable loans, so social bonds and social loans, as well as sustainability linked bonds and loans, and a combination. Of this. this is the other thing that we are doing on the uh, risk management side is to balance it. We embed uh, ESG risk analysis at the uh, very beginning of uh, you know credit risk assessment before too much time and effort is spent by the bank in the credit risk assessment. We we put in the ESG assessment and we point out. Uh, severely um, high-risk industries, um, incidents where uh, they have had a very large penalties or fines or, uh, you know, um, accidents at their factory sites or improper uh, governance. So these are cases that are highlighted specifically. There's a separate uh, ESG risk assessment uh, and a separate uh, body which approves ESG risk. And only after the ESG risk assessment is done, it moves on to credit. So this helps us sort of control the, uh, what we call hard to abate uh, sectors, the exposure to that. Although there are no uh, strong ceilings that we have set for ourselves, our exposure is less than 5% of the entire book of such severely polluting industries we've categorized as per our policy. And so we are comfortable with this approach of, you know, both looking at opportunities and looking at uh, risk. Uh, very interesting, the both on the positive side and, and as well as sort of, you know, negative side. Very helpful. Uh, maybe, Sanjeev, since you were talking about MSMEs and it started to come in, uh, as we were saying, you know, everyone's been talking about hand-holding the corporates and, and so on. How do you look at MSMEs in this space and, you know, really helping them on their green journey? First of all, I'll completely agree with Anjali uh, that going forward, the entire financing will be green financing because we have to be a safer world, right? And the fact that everyone has to get used to it. It's something like a basic in finance that I've learned. It's a triple A hai, so you can invest, right? That's simple, right? The fact that that's a benchmark. So I think that's a benchmark that is green, it's safer. It'll take time, but I am sure about it because what I'm seeing is a very slow evolution. And until unless the entire technology piece and digitization piece happens in the SME segment, we're not going to see any flow coming into this segment. That's, I'm actually with a little emphatic that MSMEs need money, MSMEs have the capability. There are people to fund it, unfortunately, because of the framework, because of the transparency, I would say, of the way they deal. That's still a question mark. But this technology part can solve it. If we were to pick up data directly from the SME's house, which resides in the banks, and banks do not have to do the risk framework that we're talking of, the fact that it gets filtered and comes, and again we filter it, again we check it, and RBI is, uh, is aware of this, but the fact is that what do we do? The fact is that the way we need to educate both the borrowers and the lenders and to come up with easier frameworks, I would say the facilitators have to be there. And I, I, can, I, can, I can request regulators that they are facilitators. Their intent is great. But at the ground level, because the bankers are a little, you know, not sure of what to take the next step, are a little more conservative. Because to err on the side of a regulation is a dangerous situation. And the fact that we've already seen some lapses in the world, when the green financing has started on a negative aspect, and I don't want to take names, because it's all in public domain, as a who are the people who are raising green finance, whether they are green finance. And I'll take an example here, which is very important. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that there's an MSME who is polluting. But they want green funding for financing. Why they can do it? Because that same polluting company has a power plant, which is on a renewable side. Now, please understand, there is, it's a, the business is polluting, but I, they have a green power or a renewable power. They'll use the renewable power to raise green funds. But will you actually say that the balance between the polluting part and the non-polluting part is justified? Until and unless measures are there to ensure that the balance is kept for the green, the parameter should not allow that company to actually go for green. That's because there are other avenues. There are no non-green, at least for, for today. They don't have to actually use the green route and color the route, actually, I would say that. So it's better to, I would say, 
the regulators or even intermediaries or the bankers, everybody need to sit down and first clarify the ESG framework. Let me put now go a level below. Do we have the ESG framework in place where every corporate in the country understands what is ESG from a global perspective? Unfortunately, and see mentioned that the global guys who are the investors will look for the global standards. Now, we have our own different standards. So I think to come up to the standard for our funding part, otherwise from yeah. a actual part, I understand that you will be compliant from our own regulations, but we have to now have a global standard. So I think the transition from a local standard to a global standard in regulations is important, but at the same time, understanding the MSMEs, which possibly US and India are the bigger you know, uh, democracies yeah. where have MSMEs, we need to handle them differently. Yeah, and, and with six crore MSMEs, you know, really thinking about how do you look at segmentation? Do you approach them via the supply chains? Do you, you know, in future, do you think this is a one star, five star, you know, different type of how people have been on their green journey? At least some, some thinking needs to be put in place. Let me, since you mentioned agriculture, uh, you know, at least let me, because that's again one very large sector that we are speaking about. Um, so getting you in on, on that one, Anjali, Many times we even find global taxonomies don't even have agriculture adequately covered, even though, frankly, that's a large part of our requirements. What do you think can be done in terms of green finance, particularly for, let's say, an agriculture you know, sector? So if you permit, I'm actually going to pick up on the ESG point. And sure. I completely agree, Sanjeev, with what you were saying. There is a reason there is greenwashing in ESG, because it is impossible to measure. What you can measure, then you can rate and then have accuracy on reporting. How will you have accuracy of reporting when you're trying to measure things which are as disparate as environment on the one hand, which is quite measurable, society which is somewhat subjective but somewhat measurable, and, and governance. Then governance. So why is it even together? I think time has come and there are lots of good people here and BCG is convening a forum uh, to think about ESG reform. Uh, and there are enough metrics now. The good news is there are metrics being evolved that measure climate action and sustainability specifically. Institutions, whether they are regulators or corporates, corporates are receivers of financing, but they're also suppliers of opportunity to banks and financing. They need to come together and say, take a view, these are the measures we will use. And there's GRI, there is uh, the task force on climate related financial disclosures. So good news is metrics are evolving. I think if we all agree globally and in India to, ask, to adopt measurable, quantifiable, objective metrics, we will actually leapfrog, much as we have many other things we have leapfrogged, we will leapfrog this whole ESG greenwashing problem. Today, there's a huge issue around measurement to the extent even carbon credits. If you look yeah. at what's happening with some of the larger trading problem, uh, platforms on carbon credits, they have stranded assets because there is a trust deficit on the MRV. So someone has to build MRV that is reliable. Yeah. I can see Centra here in the room and I'll make a plug. Centra is one of our companies. They are actually building a platform for very accurate measurement for scope three emissions for hard to abate sectors. Because you can't say as financiers and as an economy, we can't say we will not fund hard to abate sectors. So where are the alternatives to steel and cement? They don't exist today. The in the works, technology is evolving for green cement and green, uh, and green steel, but it's still expensive. Um, mm. Which allow me to then come to ag agriculture. Agriculture is a large emitter. It's a large part of not just our economy, but food security. If I think about what are the fundamental problems to be solved, there is energy security, and we all talk about energy transition gets talked about a lot, but there is food security. And in economies and Markets like ours, and India is 1.4 billion people. I think we, we accurately represent the global south in some ways. Agriculture is not just a source of food, but also a source of livelihood. Large part of our economy yeah. is still agrarian. Agriculture, on the other hand, is also a large emitter. It's a large water consumer. Um, we have now got depleted soils and groundwater. So how is that going to get recharged? So fundamental innovation on the process of growing food, the shift to regenerative agricultural practices, which will require transition financing. It's not new science anymore. The science is known. Using biomass for fuel, using uh, non-tillage agricultural practices, the science is known. How does it get financed is the question. 
Um, yeah. And that's where some of this comes into play. So at Avana, we look at uh, very early stage companies, uh, basic technologies that are solving for 90% of India's emission footprint. So around energy transition, climate resilient agriculture, supply chain and mobility. And, uh, and we see about 200 new opportunities every quarter. So what's very, very encouraging is all the problems that we see in large corporate boardrooms. And sustainability has gone from being a pollution control risk problem sitting somewhere deep down in the organization to now a strat strategic board level agenda. Yeah. All those problems will not necessarily be solved by large corporates. We will have to bring together the innovation ecosystem with our large industries and policy and large financing to solve yeah. these. Yeah, and finance in that sense can be a real solution, right? Many times the solutions, as you said, exist, you know, but they, the, the structure of cash flows is such that it doesn't work. So that's where, you know, finance or some of the things. So perhaps need. coming out of this, perhaps BCG can anchor something on blended finance. We do. I mean, we blended already, finance. We're already doing is, uh, that in a few places. We've had there. conversations on blended finance yeah. last week at the B20. Yeah. We've, uh, it's, it's very high on the agenda for even the finance minister's OECD yeah. forum, G20 forum that was held last month. Yeah. Um, and the right capital stack. So commercial capital, equity and debt, um, catalytic capital. Yeah. And this is where MDBs have to play a big role of, again, equity and debt and perhaps grant capital to provide that initial seeding of uh, new technology adoption uh, and particularly for MSMEs. Understand. Actually, let me get you, Venkateshji, at this point because we started to talk about greenwashing and, you know, how do you actually, you know, categorize what is green, what is not. Uh, and you've obviously taken some lead in terms of, you know, how do you tag certain projects and so on. Do you want to talk about, you know, how you have approached this, this particular problem? Yeah. So for us, the bread and butter is the national infrastructure pipeline. <laughs> that is something <laughs> that the starting point, apart from what is already being uh, funded or going on. So when we analyze this NIP as a uh, almost 1,45,000 crore, which is currently running. So when we did deep dive into that portfolio, so it is very clearly evident that 20-25% of that, especially in the transportation and uh, energy, they are straight away qualifying under green segment. So there is nothing much to be done. They even qualify to the extent of uh, your uh, EU taxonomy and uh, clearly visible uh, uh, financing we can attract and we can uh, even lend and have a reimbursement from the financial institutions. That is clear. So there are another 45-50% to 50 of that portfolio very much uh, needs a kind of hand-holding. So that is where the taxonomy of the country is very essential. So that whether we have to fit into the basic principles or we should go into the advanced, that all needs to be clearly defined. Assuming even if country adopts some taxonomy, most of them, at least 30-35% of them will anyway qualify for that. So that will definitely, again, a good portfolio to attract investment. And rest of the things, probably there we need to tie up with, as the NAFID is well positioned in terms of tying up with all multilateral and uh, World Bank and IFCs of the world. So where we can get into the technical assistance and uh, transaction advisory services and in preparing those projects to become more uh, green uh, compliant so that they also become uh, eligible under that segment. So in that way, if we see nearly 70% of the NIP can get into the green financing. So only 30% of which definitely we cannot make it or some information is required or to make that. It, it is a long run process. It is readily available. This is what we analyze. And on the product side, yes, the blended finance is something which we are also exploring. So most of the multilateral institutions are coming and discussing with us. Everybody would like to create a kind of fund and where we can get into mezzanine funding or kind of uh, equity or even to as a grant for VGF when its technology uh, research or development is required. So this is where there is a huge opportunity available. But as an institution, yes, we are also looking at how uh, we can get into this aspect. The third aspect is on the product side. So when it comes to the small segment, uh, because large corporates and big people were clear their market reach, especially in the urban infrastructure side, when we look at municipal corporations and where we can look at those uh, bodies to mobilize resources. Again, there only a handful of uh, municipal corporations are able to mobilize resources. But that is where we, as an AFID, can play a role by providing credit enhancement to the bond issuances. Yeah. So as a pooling, they can look at 
and that is also for some of them are would like to get into the green uh, uh, activities where we can uh, participate in their uh, barring program by providing at least for their bond issuances we can get into the credit enhancement or partial credit guarantee kind of products we are looking at so but when we started examining this as a credit enhancement the regulatory uh, prescriptions which are there uh, the circulars were issued in 2015 so when we examined there are some limitations which we have already written to reserve bank of india and had one round of discussions they are very positive they said when 2015 we issued these things were not in our mind so now definitely there is a scope for looking at it they are examining it probably those things will come institutions like nafit can very well develop such kind of products where uh, uh, credit enhancement can become very uh, clear as a mandate we need to develop bond market also so that definitely meets the expectation of the market and uh, we are uh, closely working on those lines so yeah. this is how i look at uh, the whole aspect no, very helpful and it ties back to the earlier point which was being made that you know every green msme cannot go and raise but if it's a green municipality at least some aggregation can happen and you know then people can create some sort of structures uh, you know banks can fund it you can provide credit enhancement or you know various other things structures can be brought in you can bring in some blending but bringing it all together i think uh, you know there are many some of this clustering is already being done in um, agriculture for example so the use of biodigesters so india is a country of smallholder farmers and whether it's on the dairy side or on staples growth uh, they have generally about a hectare or so of land, not viable to put in a biodigester yeah. on their own. So large procurers, so I serve on the board of Nestle, but I know Unilever, et cetera, have similar practices. Uh, organizing these at the village level yeah. um, into clusters that can then use shared equipment and create that scaling required for, for efficiency, both for process efficiency, but also for financing viability. Yeah. So it is possible to do. It does require, I think Sanjeev mentioned, you, you mentioned this earlier on, it does require extreme transparency and good governance around data. So it's good to have credible third party either on the supply chain procurement side, so there is a reliable credible procurer, which sometimes can be large corporates or governments that stand guarantee for the end use of funds and uh, the transparency of the process itself. Yeah. I'd like to add to that, yes. you know, we were speaking about blended finance and so if we've done two interesting structures, blending in terms of risk taking abilities also are different across various types of institutions and blending for commercial rates. Mm -hmm. So uh, with, uh, with DFIs, we have been very successful in doing risk participation and risk, uh, you know, blending of risk there. Whereas with uh, NBFCs who have a higher cost of funds than banks, we've been able to blend and create uh, structures for corporates, which reduces the cost of uh, the loan entirely by uh, blending together. So the challenge in these blended finance instruments that I have faced over the last few years is that uh, the you know you need to spend a lot of time and effort on to individuals construct. cases so the yeah. scalability of the solution for large banks like ours it's important to have solutions at scale for impact um, Indonesia for example has you know so you would know it's they've done an amazing thing by creating platforms where they have invited uh, you know DFIs to come in, philanthropists to come in, commercial banks to come in and then uh, you know you have a large pool of capital which is then evaluating projects. You don't have to then uh, do uh, this sort of blending on a you know Individual company case by company by case. basis. Yeah. Uh, so that that is a far easier and more uh, efficient way of you know approach uh, which I'd like to bring to the table. Completely understand. I think on the transparency and governance because on green deposits I think RBI has also come up with guidelines recently. So just wanted to get your perspective because that starts to move towards that how do you you know create let's say taxonomy, how do you create more transparency on you know let's say if one bank raises you know and and has certain ways in which how they cl classify green other banks may have different ways and it, it's great that rbi you know already saw that and and came up you know with the guidelines any perspectives on that sir and uh, how you kind of thought through the process uh, and broadly on the on the depo green deposits uh see as has been said by uh, other members the taxonomy is very important to curb greenwashing. There is absolutely no doubt on that. 
now the question is like where is the taxonomy so that's already in making mm. now pending that taxonomy should we stop doing the work that's the question it's a challenge the the climate change is a challenge can we re really differ mm -hmm. so uh, this green deposit framework that you spoke it was actually released in april just about 4 months back but it was in the making for quite a long time so we were thinking on that and uh, ultimately if you see the green deposit what exactly it is it is simply like a term deposit but in a there is a there is slight difference in a term deposit in a normal term deposit you go to a bank you give your money you don't ask uh, what you are you going to do with this and the bank would also not be interested in give, giving a response even if you ask so the thing is you are not monitoring you just have only one interest in mind if i need money or when the amount matures the money needs to be returned back to me with some interest or whatever if they want if i want in between maybe the bank can deduct some penalty that's fair enough that's part of the game but green deposit is slightly different you have to build in a use of proceeds ultimately i have given as a customer i have given my money to the bank with some thing in my mind i want the money to be invested for say sustainable agriculture for example or clean transportation whatever anything to combat climate change now if as a regulator if i am prescribing the use of proceeds just prescription you tell me is it fine it has to be monitored no it has the end use has to be seen so that is why when we were drafting the uh, framework it was there in our mind which are the sectors the questions which were coming to our mind which are the sectors how to really curb greenwashing in the sense by defining the sectors by impact assessments by the second party opinion for the financing framework by the third party assurance so all these were slowly then by disclosures mm. by board reporting so many things were built into the framework now the question is use of proceeds now use of proceeds can be very long i mean ultimately the thing has to be taxonomy there cannot be anything which can be a substitute so this is definitely not a taxonomy but we wanted to start Sir. and we wanted to remain aligned with the sovereign green bond as mr saraf mentioned about the sovereign green bond so we wanted to remain aligned with the and so that the regulators the policy makers the government they speak in the same voice the same tone the same tenor so you can see the use of proceeds in the sovereign green bond the framework which was devised by government in november last year the same nine sovereign i mean uh, the 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 sectors are basically in the green deposits so they are that way this is one thing but ultimately the taxonomy has to come and i'm sure that would be in yeah. coming bit soon okay uh, i'll maybe you know move a bit and and this one I, i'll keep it more open to you know get answer so this one is more on climate risks i think we started to talk about some of that already uh, but in the different vantage points right so here there is infrastructure there is you know banking there is markets and you know there are even individual investments how do you look at climate risks in your own uh, you know ultimately all of you are investing 100 rupees and you know so far many people think of credit risk as you know people look at credit risk they look at market risk what are the institutional ways in which you have now started to look at climate risk when you take your decisions and you know any examples anyone please feel free to add uh. see risk and opportunity are two sides of the coin same coin so when you have a problem you also have an opportunity and we do both so at avana we invest in technologies that are solving for climate it's so for us there is a large risk to the world on climate um it's a you know people talk about extinction level events this may this may be an extinction level process if we don't fix it today 
And that is the risk, and I'll come back to risk, but that's the opportunity, because everything now needs to get solved. You have to solve for energy transition, lower emissions, electric mobility, you have to engage with uh, the policy space. I mean, frankly, in India, our, our acceleration on EV adoption happened because of him. And now we are continuing to see evolution of that framework. You have to put in new charging infrastructure. You have to create new ways of doing regenerative agriculture, which is viable. So all of these are opportunities. And all of these is where you create grid-level storage, create carbon markets, all opportunities. Where is the risk for every single company today? There is an existential, existential risk from climate change. And it's as basic as where do you put your capex? Like what kind of energy are you going to plan for? Will you plan for what cost of energy will you plan for? How, do you, how will you ensure supply chain security? Uh, supply chain was mentioned earlier, but if you're a food company and you have, by the way, climate change impact is here and now today. You are seeing breakdowns in food supply chains, in certainly in fresh produce and vegetables and fruits, but increasingly we will see this in staples. Geopolitics is not helping. But so that's the risk today. Where do you put capex? How do you make sure your plant doesn't get flooded in the next big unseasonal rain? Crop failures because of unseasonal heat or destruction because of, again, too much rain. Um, wind energy, a lot of capital that went into wind suddenly became defunct because your PLF changed. Wind pattern shifted. So climate risk today, I don't think any business plans anything without taking climate risk into account. It's a given. Yeah, I think maybe coming into the framework for that, for let's say, you know, infrastructure, is that something, because obviously, you know, that, that's quite vulnerable. Uh, how have you thought about it at, at NAPFID, for instance, Venkatesh? Uh, for us, all projects are very long period, 15 to 20 years and 25 years. So obviously, this has to be part of our full assessment. But when it comes to the data points to assess this, we have a limitation. So we are really facing a challenge there. But fortunately, yes, there is something when we are discussing with some of the large uh, reinsurance companies, so they have that data so for processing and everything, So and it is available on subscription. That is something which came as a really a big uh, uh, savior for us. So we are looking from that angle. So we are trying to, whenever we meet, we discuss all these aspects with the stakeholders, especially those who are in the form of risk sharing. So here the insurance companies have got a major role to play. So we need to work with them and come out with some products or embedded uh, uh, such insurances which in our products that we can look at. That is what we are examining. And the other aspect is the new technologies which are coming, they are very much part of the infrastructure financing. For example, we have got a hybrid and 24 by 7 uh, power supply where even batteries also work and provide during the peak hour uh, uh, requirements. So these are very really on paper, it looks very good. But when it comes to the viability of the projects, especially as in the wind, we have already seen 70% of the projects are below P90 levels, which is the basic assumption in our finance model. So they don't sustain. So considering that, whether these technologies will, how long they sustain, because these are all 20, 25 years loan. The batteries which we are using, whether will they withstand that and uh, performance guarantees are not available. So these are the challenges we are looking at, but still we need to test and try. So now, are we willing to lose money or is there any support available? Can we look at those from that angle? Because this needs to be tested. We cannot shy away from getting into that activity. So these are the challenges we are looking at. So, but solutions are available. There are uh, corporates who are really taking responsibilities and they are willing to provide, uh, put more uh, their equity. So debt equity ratios they are looking at. And this is where this blended finance, where uh, some of the GCFs of the world, they are looking at participating in such projects. Even the risk is high, but still they want to come as a, uh, so mezzanine debt or a supportive kind of thing. Uh, risk capital is also expected there. So this is how we are looking from all these angles. So, but it, it takes longer time. It is yeah. not easy to convince and get those things rolled out, but it is a work in progress. Yeah. So, so we look at it in you know two, three, two, three ways, slightly differently. We look at physical risk. Uh, it's been a little more um, easy to assess on a project-to-project -project basis. Although on a portfolio level, if you try to assess the physical risk of our client's assets, it becomes impossible to collect data at that scale. However, at the assessment level, individual assessment level, when we are seeing proposals, we do uh, check for the exposures that we are financing. Are they in economically, uh, ecologically sensitive areas or coastal areas? 
and so on and so forth. So physical risk is easier to, you know, uh, take stock of. Transition risk is something in that in our framework, we look at the sectoral level. So we've defined sectors which per se face higher transition risk. And with the help of experts, uh, we do try to see uh, and be a little proactive in um, sort of managing our or controlling our exposures to sector with high transition risk. In uh, physical risk, uh, uh, since it's on a case-to-case -case basis, the mitigation is more a diversification of the portfolio geographically. Uh, that's the way uh, we approach it. Very helpful. I, I, I'll take a different take. I can see that we're talking of risk mitigations and all that. It's possibly from coming from the lending and borrowing aspect. And we're talking of green financing. I'm an investor, Naika. Let me <laughs> give you the equity side of it. And that's an interesting trend that's happening in green financing. Whether we are aware or not aware, let me give you a data hardcore that the global financial investors are ready to give a higher valuation to a company with better ESG framework in place. Now, if that happens, Please understand whether regulations are there or not there. And that's what I say as a marketer, that the money will flow in to the person who is compliant. So hence, the boardroom discussions, as Anjali said, is now becoming strategic in part of EC. So the same thing for green financing. It is a board's decision, the CFO's decision, as to how compliant you need to be. So from the borrower's perspective, things can change. And if that change happens, then the investor, investing world out there will come in. So I think equity also needs to be looked into it uh, from that aspect. And one product that I can think, if the banks can't do it, and the mezzanine finance, of course, NAFIT can do it, is that mezzanine finance for large companies where the promoters need funding can be looked into it. And I, I don't see a problem. As I said, there's no difference between a green financing and a non-green financing till it matches the requirement of the green framework that the regulators want us with the country. Very interesting. I, I, I can even maybe take it one level further to say what will be the day when we actually start to see in the, you know, research reports as well, climate risk of this particular companies, you know, that's where everyone becomes educated that these are important risks to this company or to this sector, which needs to be very much, you know, at the but center. need to shift it, if you can shift it from just the climate risk piece, yeah. which every business has to think about risk and yeah. turn it into an opportunity Positive. piece. Yeah. You have lower cost of energy when you are able to do hybrid RTC. Yeah. You're actually, your net cost of energy is lower. Uh, you know, you mentioned how do you look at um, getting data for insurance. We've talked to three companies in the last month alone that are putting up dedicated satellites. And these are India-based companies. There are 13 other US-based companies or Israel-based companies that are doing the same that are putting up dedicated satellites using a variety of data sources to triangulate and they're actually working directly with the reinsurers yeah. to create that granular data at a meter by meter level to understand what is risk at the ground level in water, atmospheric and thus be able to do predictive modeling now using generative AI. And that sometimes become then competitive advantage. That is competitive in, advantage. In some sense. So, so companies that recognize this better, insurers that use this better will be able to price risk and hence become more competitive. So I think it is actually a matter of business opportunity. Those that adopt faster, much like we saw with technology yeah. and digital, yeah. they will get a front foot. Yeah. And, and anyone, please, if you're looking for technology-based solutions, feel free to talk to us. Literally, we are seeing amazingly high quality founders building in each of these spaces. And these are people who could have gone and built the next blockchain or the next, and blockchain is being used in this space, of course, but the next e-commerce or the next fintech. And instead they're saying, I want to solve a more fundamental and a larger problem. Very interesting. I almost see it for those followers of cricket, right? There's defense and offense both, and, and you can play, you know, both those strategies. Uh, I'm also conscious of time. So then moving to the last question, and this one is more, you know, on the carbon market side, because, you know, obviously there is an element which, you know, the companies can take care of themselves and, you know, everyone is on that green journey. But there are almost two aspects, right? One, there, there might still be residual emissions which you do need to take care of or also, you know, in your journey, till the time you, you know, you're able to get your internal act in place, you may need to, you know, look at carbon markets for that time being. Uh, Anything that you've already started to see in that space or perspectives of how we see that growing? Anjali, do you want to come in? So, you know, we, we touched a little bit on cost of capital. I think the points Anjali, you were mentioning earlier, 
having better climate and sustainability related strategies enables your brings down your net cost of capital equity debt and everything else carbon markets and carbon credit products are one part of that financial portfolio that smart companies and cfos and boards are starting to see the challenge we see today with carbon markets and it's uh, it's been around now for more than a decade is creating adequate um, supply so on the demand side more and more there is demand for offsets and credits uh, but the offsets and credits don't solve the problem you are just transferring it from one balance sheet to another um, but it's still a required liquidity mechanism to create more um, carbon projects of high enough quality that are reliable i'd mentioned earlier there's an issue around uh, validity of some of the carbon credits that are being traded there was a expose in the guardian a couple the of months quality ago and around so. quality so i think the work that needs to be done certainly is around taxonomy and our regulator as always is on the front foot there i think india is progressive we are fortunate to have a progressive regulator so around taxonomy around uh, using better technology and data sources for validation so mne and then validation and thus having a more credible source of supply for carbon markets and then of course integrating with the rest of the world from an india point of view yeah and and making sure i think you talked about it but uh, we were discussing this before it doesn't become a license to pollute like just the fact that you know so i think that's that's pretty obvious so i think it was a very interesting discussion uh, got to hear a lot of perspectives from various angles you know we have the right uh, i would say frameworks coming in we have people who are working on green infrastructure we have green deposit green loans those who are getting us green bonds and attracting the right capital and those who are getting the right startups to uh, you know get uh, you know a lot of the technology in place let's hope with all of that we never go to the ending that was proposed in extrapolations and it was all you know just one dream that we found that we found a way out of so here's looking at the possibilities thank you so much for joining it was a pleasure having this conversation thank you